and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast. I am uh, sitting in the New York office, and uh, it is actually before the market has opened on Friday morning that we're recording, but it's kind of bizarre to think about. Um, and by the way, I'm not going to be talking that much today about what's happened this week or last week or things like that, but I just, I was thinking about it as I was walking into the office this morning from my apartment that... I recorded last week's Dividend Cafe on Thursday after the market closed from our Newport Beach studio. So the Dividend Cafe came out on Friday and it was the Thursday night uh, into Friday morning that the diagnosis of, of uh, President Trump's COVID positive came in. And so it wasn't addressed last week. And then I don't have anything to say about it this week because we're already kind of like past that. And yet in between there was the hospitalization at Walter Reed and uh, some medication and, and or therapeutic and kind of the, you know, questions last weekend about what the doctors were saying and all that stuff. And and in a weird way, that that almost feels, just from recording Divin Cafe last week to recording this week, that feels like a total non-story now as we look into where we are with the stimulus and where we are with the election and other things. So, um, the President of the United States, like the most powerful person in the world, who is in that vulnerable demographic, uh, you know, uh, uh, health-wise, weight-wise, uh, age-wise, what have you, contracted this disease that has take that has really commanded the entire attention of the global media and and economy and and society over the last uh, six to eight months. And, and yet it's completely out of the, the headlines in, in less than a week. It's just, this 2020 can't get a whole lot weirder. And so when I say I'm not going to talk about the market uh, this week that much today, it's because I actually have something I want to talk to you about that's, I think, much more significant, longer term, deeper rooted, more significant with its implications to investors. And, and you know, quickly, I, I, I will allude to the fact that it was quite an up and down, mostly up week as far as volatility. It's very important to remember volatility is bi-directional. So when I say volatility and they're mostly up, that isn't inconsistent. There's no rule that says volatility is always to the downside. That doesn't make any sense. But having like a 400 point update Monday and then being up a couple hundred Tuesday before dropping 600, so down 400 Tuesday, then up over 500 Wednesday and another couple hundred or whatever Thursday, and now the futures, as I'm talking on Friday morning, are up another 150 points. And so, you you know, the stimulus uh, or potential for some stimulus or potential for targeted stimulus or what have you is lingering. I'm not sure it's only the market looking for these the, the, the overall stimulus package from a truly economic standpoint. I do think a lot of it has more to do with traders trying to be positioned around such and not wanting to miss what could be an imminent announcement, not wanting to be short into an announcement, and then also traders that, if they don't believe it will happen, wanting to exploit that as well, so you get some of these up and down movements. But um, I did something with DividendCafe.com today that I've not done. I, I, I think I wrote in there that I've never done it, and as I think about it, it's possible I've done it before, but it's been so long I can't remember. But I just sat down and started writing. And I wrote all the way through, and it was a single topic, and and generally in a given week, just not that you care, but the inside baseball, I'll write part of Divin Cafe on a Saturday morning, and I'll write part of it on a Sunday afternoon, and I'll read you know three research papers Monday morning that inspired me to write some new stuff then, and so it gets written piecemeal throughout the week, and and there's little. Um, inspirations and and ad hoc you know uh, issues that come up that drive that. But that's why it is um, very purposely uh, uh, has been a multi-topic commentary uh, for for 12, the 12 years I've been doing it. The Divin Cafe today it was written all the way through and it's kind of more single essay, but I broke it up with different sub sub headline type things, subtitles to, to make it a little easier to read. But it addresses the subject of um, a new paradigm, and, and you could argue it's been there before, but it's now here more. And that is this concept of don't just stand there, do something. That is the governing philosophy of um, policymakers. And I refer here to regulators, 
Um, it's very rare that there's one who believes their job is to regulate less, to take away things for them to do. They mostly believe what can we do more to help a given situation impact an outcome. To monetary policymakers, central bankers, who most certainly believe in very aggressive intervention for them to effectively do their job and to uh, try to spruce up the economy, to try to impact full employment and so forth. And then um, obviously on the fiscal policy side, the idea of a president or a Congress not intervening to go help the economy by targeted spending, targeted actions around uh, the government treasury, um, it's been a very long time. And that's sort of at the heart of Keynesian economics, which has governed a lot of, of US federal policy for, um, you know, about 75 years. I, I, I don't know that it matters if we should sometimes don't just do something and stand there as opposed to don't just stand there and do something. But I do think it matters a great deal to investors that we recognize that we're in a don't just stand there, do something world. And what that generally will mean is greater federal budget deficits. And that generally means um, quite uh, explicitly um, that they have to take money out of the private sector to do that. The government can only spend money that they tax and they're either taxing it in the present tense through taxes or in the future sense through borrowings. And so they pull future growth forward into the present or they extract money from the private economy through taxation. Okay, this isn't controversial. What's controversial is people will debate as to whether or not they should do that and how they should do it and how much they should do it. All legitimate debate topics. What isn't controversial is that that's how government is funded. Government's funded from taxes or from borrowings, nothing else, okay? So when you concede the point that the government has to pull money from the private sector, either in the present or future tense, to run greater and greater fiscal expansions, fiscal interventions, not just standing there but doing something, I think you, you sow the seeds of what becomes the disinflationary spiral that we have. And that is that you um, have taken away future growth to try to get a current remedy. And then you have monetary policy that is coupled to that where they will um, you stimulate using lower interest rates, bond buying. There, there's kind of, I think, an ongoing science experiment as to how much monetary experimentation can be done at the central bank level. And that in, in pushing those rates lower, it, it all works together for a very deflationary spiral. And it, of course, has brought bond yields down and, and has really created an incredibly um, uh, never unprecedented mix of, of policy and um, expectations into the future. And so this goes beyond the points I've been making for months and months and is one of the major tenets in our Operation Magnify about uh, the implications to bond investors. It does indeed, I think, with bond yields now at the zero bound as a result of interventions in fiscal and monetary policy, it does have implications as to the ability of uh, boring bonds to mitigate risk in the future. But it also has a lot of implications for equity investors. Indexing, I think, ha becomes a, a uh, self-fulfilling prophecy where big companies, when you buy an index, you're buying more of the big companies and they're big because they've already done well and you're buying less of the smaller companies and they're smaller because they haven't done as well. So you guarantee a future underperformance in terms of the um, construction and composition of how indexes are, are devised, their basic methodology. You just can't time when that might happen. And it rewards um, chasing popularity and, and yet true value gets mismarked until it doesn't. So you have a really profound implication in the current environment for index investing with equity and for boring bonds with people that are looking for either yield, which they're not gonna get, or risk mitigation, which they're not gonna get. And so I think that this story, the causation of which is a conscious decision 
for policymakers to intervene more and not less, that you get this kind of feedback loop where the more that um, one intervenes fiscally, the more they need to intervene, and certainly the more monetary intervention, the more future monetary intervention. It exacerbates boom and bust cycles, which then makes us more averse to risk and yet less prepared to deal with the risk because we don't have boring bonds to help it or because equity volatility, equity indexing is less efficient. So it's, it's a fascinating time to be an investment advisor. And I hope if I'm not doing it justice for you right now in this podcast or video, um, and you'll please forgive me, I do have a little bit of a sore throat, but I hope you will read DividendCafe.com because I think I'm unpacking in a way that I was happy with, the way I wrote it. Um, I think I'm unpacking what I think is the most profound uh, uh, crux of tension for investors in the, in the decade and decades to come. And so it's, as far as what needs to be done about that, that risk assessment, that understanding of dividend growth, that, that a, a 10 year, let's say it's paying you 0.5% in the treasury bond market, and, and you can get 4.5% with some, a diversified set of dividend stocks, you have to understand you're giving up 87% of the income for the right to know you're gonna get the coupon, and, and you're missing out on a, a 400% premium just because of the alleged uncertainty of those dividends coming when in fact, one can actively manage their way to seeing that they're buying companies that have been paying their dividends over and over and over again for years to come, uh, for decades uh, in the past. So, so my point being, I think dividend growth, I think alternatives, I think rethinking boring bonds, all of these things are really on the menu and available to help investors in a thoughtful way. And that's what Dividend Cafe is about this week. I hope you've gotten something out of this. Um, I have to jump into a symposium right now. It's virtual this year, but I'll share more about that next week. In the meantime, reach out anytime with questions. And thank you very much for listening to and watching The Dividend Cafe.